like to have us consider the church of Laodicea as portrayed in the book of Revelation chapter 3. Now the church in Laodicea was an apathetic church. Apathy is to lack interest or desire for action. It can also be a lack of feeling. Laodicea was a church smug and set in its ways with no desire to make a difference. If I was to think of an apathetic character, it would be Dagwood Bumstead from the Blondie cartoon strip. Now Dagwood, who is never too interested at the office in getting his work done, but at home he also just loved the couch more than any of the chores that Blondie would have for him to do. But Dagwood is not totally apathetic because if there was one thing that transform, transforms him into action, it would be food. Now, before we look at the church in Laodicea, we need to get the lay of the land and of the city itself. It was situated on the main road to the east and at a junction of several other routes. And it was obvious that it would become a very successful city. Laodicea was one of the great commercial and strategic centers of the ancient, ancient world. It boasted an affluent society and was noted for its banking and clothing manufacturing. Now the first thing we discover is a vision of Christ. As we come to Revelation chapter 3, we look at verse 14 and we see a vision of Christ. We read, And to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, these things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. Now, in this vision, Christ is the Amen. And when we use the word Amen, it can be an expression of approval or an affirmation that something is true. Amen. Jesus Christ is the Amen. He is the truth and affirms all that is truth. He is the God of truth. Further in this vision, we see that Christ is the faithful and true witness. Christ is the faithful and true witness. To be a witness has three essential conditions. First of all, you must have seen with your own eyes what you are going to tell about. That makes you a witness. Secondly, you must be honest in your account to repeat with accuracy what took place. And then thirdly, you must be able to communicate clearly what you saw and what you heard. Christ is the perfect witness because having come from God, he tells us firsthand. He knows what the Father is like. He come from heaven. And so we can rely on his words for he is the Amen and he is the truth. And certainly there is no question about his communication ability, for there are none his equal. Lastly, in this vision from Revelation chapter 3, Christ is the ruler of God's creation. Christ is the ruler of God's creation. Everything that exists is under his rule. He is over it all because he is also the creator. In John 1, 3, we can read, All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. We have here a vision of Christ that sees him over all things and relating to all in truth. What he tells us is an accurate account of what really exists. Now we come to Christ's condemnation of the church. Christ's condemnation of the church. Revelation 3, beginning at verse 15. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, the Laodicean church was lukewarm in fervor. Their deeds were open to evaluation, and as far as Christ was concerned, they were neither hot nor cold in their endeavors. It's simple to understand the analogy. A hot drink we can enjoy, a cold drink we can enjoy, but a lukewarm drink, not so much. This church was apathetic in their church life. 
Christ would rather them to have been one or the other. If they had been hot and on fire in their work and service in their spiritual life, God would be pleased. If they had been cold and not involved and lacking in their spiritual life, God would not have been pleased, but would not have expected anything from them either. But the Lacedians were a church that gave the impression they were committed, but in heart they were not. You would have not have known where you stood with them. Maybe they would and maybe they wouldn't. It's hard to deal with a people like that, isn't it? You see, no general of any army would want to have soldiers who are only half committed. It doesn't work. No leader wants to have followers with reservations. No leader desires a loyalty that has turned into apathy. Here was a church that professed Christianity while remaining untouched by its fire, half-hearted in its zeal, uncommitted, yet giving the impression of being committed. It's a sad state of affairs for a church in such a condition. They believe in the great truths of God's word, but, it, but they never put these truths into action. Because of their lukewarm condition, they are about to be spit out. It is a most forceful rejection for this kind of a church. We've had the vision, we've just covered the condemnation, and now Christ's counsel to the church. Christ's counsel to the church at Laodicea in verses 17 to 18 of chapter 3. Because you say I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, blind, and naked, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. The church needed a reality check. They were in need of nothing and proud of it. They had it all. Money was no object. They viewed themselves wealthy by acquisition. Whatever they needed, they had, or so they thought. But Christ, the faithful witness, sees it differently. Christ counsels them to buy from him, to buy gold refined in the fire. My sense is that this is faith, that Christ is talking about faith. Wealth cannot bring happiness, nor give health nor give comfort in sorrow or companionship in loneliness. But if you have faith, faith which is refined in the fire of trials, it will allow you to face anything. The person of faith indeed is rich. White clothes. He wants them to get white clothes to cover their nakedness. Nakedness in the ancient world was the worst of humiliation and shame one could endure. And so to be clothed in the fine garments was an honor. And so here Christ offers them white clothes. The clothes we wear make a statement about us. Christ is saying that he will clothe them in purity and no shame. Then I salve so that they can see. I salve. They are blind to their own spiritual condition. And Christ says, come to me. And let me show you your true state. You see, for the beginning of change to start in one's life, you need to see yourself as you really are. The alcoholic has to see themselves as an alcoholic. Any addict has, uh, as an addict, they have to see themselves that they are an addict. It is the beginning to changing one's life, to admit. Now we come to, fourthly, Christ's compassion for this church. Christ's compassion for the church. In verses 19 to 20, As many as I love I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. We come now to one of the most beautiful and vivid pictures in Scripture. It is the picture of Christ standing outside the door and he's knocking. There is no latch on the outside of the door to be found 
because it has to be opened from the inside. We need to also note that this is not an appeal to the sinner, but rather to the saint. These words are to the church, to those who are the saints. It's an appeal to those who are saved and not to the unsaved. It has been written to a church and not to the world. Christ's rebuke and discipline is a sign of his love. That's the first thing we can note. There should be no surprise here that God's, God disciplines those that he loves. It is a fact of life that there is no surer way of allowing a child to ruin their life than by letting them do whatever they like. The best athletes, the finest scholars, are those that receive the hardest and most demanding of training. They worked hard. And so the rebuke here is not to scold and to re release a flood of angry words, but rather to speak so that they see the error of their ways. It is the kind of rebuke which compels a person to admit their error. In any event, we should not resent God's rebuke and discipline, but we should rather be thankful for it because it shows His great love for us. Secondly, Christ pleads for their response. He pleads for their response. He is there at the door of the church and at the door of our lives, and He's knocking, knocking, and He wants to enter. We have faltered in our relationship with Him. We have relied more on ourselves and on our wealth than on Christ. We have placed Him outside of the church. This is what happens. We speak of Him, we sing of Him, and we pray to Him, but He's not with us. He's on the outside. His compassion, however, is great. And He desires to yet give us opportunity to get it right. Isn't that wonderful? The gospel of second chances. And so Christ offers them, thirdly, relationship. He offers them relationship. Here is the wonder of it all. In spite of our tepid condition, despite our sorry state, Jesus still wants to come and have a relationship with us. This has been the problem all along for the Laodiceans. They have not been in relationship with their Lord and Savior. They meet for worship and pray and sing, but their lives and their church is void of any intimacy with Jesus. Nothing close, nothing of value, no relationship. And so Jesus says, just open the door and I'll come in and we'll have a party together. Fifthly, Christ's call for individual response. We see this in verses 21 to 22. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes. To him who overcomes, Christ seeks the church to come around to him but he also seeks individuals as well to whoever, whoever who overcomes. There is a call here to strive and to hang in there. And if we do, the reward will be great. A throne will be the reward. The throne of Christ is a spectacular, is spectacular because he is over everything. It's all been given to Christ and he shares it with us. Secondly, it's to him who hears. To him who hears. This is the message to the church, but it comes first to the individual who is spiritually in tune enough to hear. The church is made up of individuals. It always starts with one and then another and another. That's how it works. The church of Laodicea was apathetic in its service to God. They had all the form of spirituality, but no substance no relationship with Christ. They had religion, but they did not have Christ himself. He was found on the outside, knocking to enter in. How about our church today? How about each of us today? Is Christ in our midst? Are we in relationship with him, truly in relationship? Is he really the motive and reason for our being together and a part of the church? Is he the fire burning in our bones that motivates us to serve him and share the gospel? Or do we only have the building, the programs, and the outreach to serve ourselves, 
void of God himself. Jesus Christ pleads with us to let him into our lives and the life of our church, to have a great relationship with him and to party with him. Is that happening in your life? Is Jesus truly there with you or have you forgotten him and squeezed him to the outside? Listen again to his invitation. Here in chapter 3, beginning at verse 18. I counsel you, says Jesus, to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so that you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, as we consider the state of our relationship with you, as we consider the state of our church, may we not be like the church of Laodicea. It is a warning to us, and yet the counsel is there that Christ is knocking at the door of our heart and of our lives, and he wants to be a part of it. And may we never, never shut you out. May we never, never only put on a show. May it always be real, Lord. And I pray, Lord Jesus, may your spirit be working in each of our lives and challenge us and convict us and lead us in a wonderful relationship with you. And I pray that that is the case for most people. I pray that that is the case for most of us in the church at Rimmel Road. But Lord, should there be any that we have only been going through the motions and we're really not in relationship with you, may we repent of our sin and may we come to you and receive from you and allow you to come into our lives. I pray this, Lord Jesus, forgive us. Forgive us when we have done wrong. Forgive us when we have ignored you. Forgive us when we have only been pretending. Lord, for any in that position, Lord, may they turn to you and receive you afresh and anew. May their lives be on fire. Even in the midst of what's going on in the world, there's much for us to do. Lord, challenge us to help and see our part, working with you, Lord Jesus, serving you, for you are our God. May we be your people. Amen. Amen. God bless you.